it's able to run both of these things. Wow, amazing. 2.5 kilowatts. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Check it out. We are going to be reviewing a new power station. This is a power station by eTaker. It's a 2000 watt, fairly kind of large to medium size that can run a bunch of stuff. They also sent me their solar panel here. This is a 200 watt solar panel. Also going to unbox that. We're gonna take everything out of the packaging, just check it out in detail and charge it up, see how it charges on the multiple different ways you can charge these things. And then just really put them to the test and see how they perform. And really if you're getting what you're paying for, you know? Anyway, let's get started guys with testing out and reviewing the eTaker M2000 solar generator with their portable S200 solar panels. All right, so first things first, of course. I do like how they have this box with these two handles up here. Um, these things, I do a lot of these reviews on these power stations and my goodness, carrying these things around, you know, these things can weigh up to like 40 to even more poundage, the bigger they get, of course, and smaller. But for this size, I think these kind of handles are really necessary and it really helps. So thank you, eTaker, for putting handles in your box. That's a big bonus. Let's just, first of all, get this thing out of the box, see what it all comes with. Usually they have these little accessory boxes up top. So awesome, we have three ways to charge it. AC charge cable, they like plug into your house and charge it. Car charging cable, looks like they spelled charging wrong on that one, that's not a very good sign. And it looks like they kind of meant to say solar charging cable, um, but they labeled it car charging cable. So a little bit worrisome, but you know, mistakes happen, this is, kind of just been released and this is probably pre-release packaging so hopefully they fix it and it tells you the three ways to charge right here so let's open up this accessory box first see what's inside wow so this is some thick cable man oh my gosh 14 gauge wire we got that xt60 type connector and these are the solar panel connectors right the waterproof uh, solar connectors that we can plug into solar panels. So that's gonna have it on the other side there. And this looks like a pretty long cable. Let's see, I'm six foot and this cable is about, I wanna say five feet tall. So that's a five foot solar charging cable. Two more things. So that's gonna be our power to plug into the house, right? And then this is our car charging cable. I'm liking this little grippy green rubber here to help you kind of put it in and out of your cigarette lighter there. So you can also charge this from your car when you're driving or start your car and use it as a generator, right? To charge your devices. So that's everything in there. Let's get to the main event here, guys. And here we go. <clears throat> wow. By the way, here's some specs. I'm just gonna let you look at the box here. Uh, so it's model M2000, it's a 2008 watt hour, 32.4 volt, 62 AH amp hour if you're wondering. AC charge input up to 1400 watts, so that is crazy. They're getting pretty fast at charging. Most of them have the new GAN technology, which is the gallium in their batteries that enable them to charge faster without any problems. They're all usually lithium phosphate batteries now. A lot safer and longer longevity and they last just a lot longer for the amount of charges you can do. It takes a thousand watt max of solar input. Wow, so this machine can handle a lot of heavy lifting, that's awesome. So it's supposed to do a pure sine wave inverter output of 2000 max and it surges to 4000 at 120 volt. You know, this is the American version. AC output in bypass mode is 1600 watts and a surge of 4000 watts. Anyway guys, basically that's it on the box. I just wanted to show you what this thing kind of looks like. And let's get to the power station and just really take a look at it before we test this thing out. So they're going with kind of an all aluminum look. This is kind of interesting. So take a look at this bad boy. The whole case is aluminum this way. So it's surrounding in an aluminum all the way around. It's just like the ends are the plastic interfaces, right? Let's get a look at the main interface here. So we have our on-off power button here. Let's see if I just hold it on, there we go. 
The interface is gonna be kind of flashing because of the frame rate on my camera here, but not one of the best interfaces I've seen. They're just kind of using a white LED on a black display. Some of the other ones are really colorful, really bright, and they do well. So this is not the best I've seen here. We have our USB on and off here, and I like how they're covering up all the USB ports. You don't normally see that. We have two standard USB-A at 2.4 amp. Then we have two standard QC30 USB-As that can do 60 watts. And then we have the PD3.0s, which can do 100 watts for that USB-C charging on, you know, everybody's phones and tablets are now, they can fast charge. Really like how they, you can cover these up just to kind of keep the dust out and stuff. There's our DC button to turn on our DC rail here. Just your basic outputs right here. It's interesting they're putting the input right in this rail too. These three are gonna be outputs and then this is gonna be an input right here. That's where you're gonna hook up pretty much all your connectors, your solar and your car charging. And then you're gonna hook up your home charging somewhere else. And then we have our AC button here and three AC outlets with dual outlets under each one. That's great. So you have a grounded outlet here and a non-grounded outlet on top. So effectively, we've got six outlets, three are grounded, three are not. Awesome. And these doors don't seem to give us too much trouble putting back in. Some of them are really rubbery and they just won't push in very good, but these are pushing in solid. I don't know if you can see that, but it looks like they are sending it to me at 59% charged. So we just got the e-taker brand on the side. Again, this is completely encapsulated all the way around in aluminum. Cooling vents down here. Nice rubber feet right here on these kind of protruding little legs here. This aluminum feels real solid, geez. It feels like about, I wanna say about 20, 25 pounds. So not too heavy. Looks like they're really compacting everything up. Let's take a look at the other side. So we've got this light. Looks like we gotta press and hold it. There we go, wow. So I'm seeing a bunch of LEDs in here. I had to press and hold it to turn it on. I just pressed it again and look how bright it got. So it gradually got bright. Press it again for flashing. Looks like an SOS flash. And then that's just a constant flash. Press it again to go on low again and then just press and hold to turn it off. Pretty cool. We have fan openings here for cooling. And then this is where we're gonna charge our AC input and check this out, AC extend. So it looks like you're gonna be either able to connect another one of these or they have a unit like this that's just a battery so you can extend that and extend your capacity. I'm not sure, we'll have to maybe look that up. But anyway, that's where you're gonna plug it into your wall. I like these little flaps here to kind of keep the dust out of everything like I was saying. If there's anything right off the bat, it's just how entirely solid this solid piece aluminum case is. I know I keep saying that, but you don't normally see them like this. So it seems like, you know, this thing is not going to get banged up. I mean, it is anodized aluminum, so it might get a little bit scratched if you're, you know, rubbing it on metal or something. What I'm noticing too is on the handles, let me flip it over here, underneath the handles here, this is a rubber, a nice comfortable rubber grip. It's kind of like almost like a rubber foot, but it's rounded and it really is comfortable to carry it. Anyway, guys, that's the power station. Let's put her on the side there and open up this solar panel. All right, so this is the 200 watt guy. And of course, uh, that's gonna be the Mac. So they're usually gonna be charging your devices under that, depending on the sun, right? So packed very well. So this is one of the nicer ones I've seen, actually. It's very well put together. We have our little zipper case here, kind of integrated. And there's our manual for it right here. And then we have a pretty long solar cable with a nice Velcro to hold it all together. I like Velcros instead of tie wraps. All right, this one has a tie wrap on, but check this out. So this is a dual connector. So that's where we're gonna plug into this power station. But it also has kind of a universal plug too. And then we have the two cables. This looks like about a three foot cable to plug into our solar connection on here. So this is great. We actually have multiple cables. Remember the unit here itself, the power station already came with its solar cable. So we have a backup in case we need it that we can keep with the solar panel as well. And I just kind of want to see how long 
uh, this solar cable is. So remember we had about five foot that came with the, the actual power station. Let's see how long this one, if we you know put those two together. It looks like this is just about five foot as well. So we have like a total of 10 feet to separate the power station and the solar panel. So at least that's better than most. It is kind of interesting how they did not put the connection in here. They actually put it in the handle. You see how it's coming out of the zipper case. I'm not really sure too much how I feel about that. Uh, it is nice to just have this be able to zipper and seal up so you're not getting any like moisture if it starts to rain or something. And just keep in mind too, this zipper is not weatherproof. Most of them are, this is not. We've got these cool little stands. You see there on the side, they just kind of have a, a little stretchy strap here that can expand out to stand them up. And then they just have this little button clip. You snap them in. Let's open this bad boy up and check it out. So these are little flexible, look at these. These are little flexible panels. So definitely wanna be kinda of careful not to flex these too much. You wouldn't want the actual solar modules to crack, but that's how this thing is. It's definitely gonna be lighter than it normally would. Let's just pull this thing all the way apart here. So there we go. So we've got four panels and that's pretty big. The only problem with being this flexible is sometimes it's hard to stand them up. So we're gonna test that out with these little feet. I do like the little grommets here. They're kind of built into the whole solar panel deal. I'm not sure how I feel about that too, is if some wind comes up and you know you have a rope around here, it seems like it could tug on the actual solar panel material too much. But anyway, a grommet built in on all four corners and also on each solar panel on either side, there's grommets as well for strapping it down. So the way these fold up is the middle ones are gonna fold in and then the outer ones fold up and check this out. So this is magnetic as well. We have these two magnet surfaces here and they just link together. So overall, a, um, a lighter solar panel than most 200 watt solar panels. But again, there's always a trade-off when you have uh, lightness versus durability. And let's get this thing charging on a solar panel for a while. We'll switch over to a vehicle, see how that lighter adapter charger does. And then we'll get in the house, put it on a uh, 110, 120 receptacle AC, see how fast it charges off of that. Okay guys? Okay, let's see how it is really setting these things up. Definitely lighter than a normal 200 watt solar panel, that's for sure. So the feet are gonna come out this way. So we're gonna need to put it on the ground like this. I'll just go right in front of the car here. It's like this is the best solar area. So we're gonna pop these feet off. Looks like we only got three. There's always one usually with these foldable solar panels that don't have a foot. Okay guys, and as with all solar panels, the more perpendicular you are to the sun, the better charging you're gonna get. So that looks pretty good for this time of day. Just before noon, winter time, and so the sun's a little low in the sky. But let's see what kind of wattage we can get from this angle here. That's how they look, just all folded out. Seem to be doing pretty good. Not sure how it'd be in a really heavy wind, but at least they give you grommet holes to strap them on. This is where it's a little difficult to keep these things clean, especially if you're setting up a solar panel. <laughs> so like if you're dragging them around the dirt, just make sure you, um, you know, you kind of blow them out and make sure there's no dirt in there because it will ruin your seals and stuff. What it would be kind of cool is to see companies like this to give you some kind of little uh, baggie. They should start making little baggies for these to, or little caps, you know, that kind of push on and clip. That would be awesome if they could make some kind of a protector because these things always get kind of goobered up and dirty. And it just seems like after a while, it's gonna mess with the connections. So just pushing both of these two things in until they click. Then all we're doing is plugging it into the power station. And remember this power station has the input right over here. Now I have it off right now. I just wanna see if it kicks on. Some of the older ones didn't kick on. You had to turn them on yourself to get charging. So let's see what this thing does. Plugging in, awesome. So it kicked on. Hopefully you can see this guys. I know the frequency is gonna be weird. It's probably gonna be flashing. Uh, if you can't see it, I'm going to tell you that it's saying we have a solar input here. There's a little solar panel. It's saying there's 130 watts about in this sun orientation with a little bit of clouds in the sky and in the wintertime here. 
It says it's going to take 6.7 hours up here to charge at 130 watts. And this side's our output. It's all off. So right now it's at 59%. I'm going to set a timer for a half hour. And we're going to see how much that can actually charge in a half hour of sun like this. Always want to put this power stations in the shade and usually behind the solar panels is a good spot if you don't have much cable. But, you know, we got a good 10 feet of cable here so we could move this power station around to the other side of the car if we wanted to. Oh gosh. So we just got a swirling gust and look what happened, guys. So this is something you're going to have to watch out for. Hopefully they're okay. It fell right on their face. So really, see that's what I was talking about. These lighter solar panels that are thin and flexible. They just don't really have the mass and that's the conundrum is it's heavy and sturdy or light and blows away. A few moments later. Let's check this thing out. So in slightly, you know, variable cloud situation, right now the clouds are mostly covering up the sun. We're gonna see what we're charged to and we're only to 62% in a half hour. So really gonna affect your charging. I'm only getting 47 watts of input right now, 50. The highest I've seen it go was 140-ish watts when the sun was fully out. There wasn't really cloud, much clouds in front of it. Anyway, we're going to take this into the car now, see how it charges on a car plug. Any of you solar companies are listening, just put all of these Velcro tabs on all of your wires. It really does help. All right guys, so you're on the road and your battery is low for whatever reason. Say you are, who knows, driving to a location, another location you're camping or your battery died and you wanted to, you know, you need to do a trip, drive around, whatever. You can charge it in your car as well. So we're gonna plug in to the lighter adapter here. Plug in the other side to right where we plugged in the solar input. Let's see if that sucker kicks on. There we go. So just with the ACC on, it's charging at 18 watts to 57 watts. Whoa. It's going up to 75 watts when my car's not even started. Now that my car's running, we are charging at 86 watts, and it's going to take 11 hours, 9.7. It's kind of adjusting itself here to get to 100% from 62%. Okay guys, the final charge test before we start running things off of it. Just plug right in here to the wall on our grid power. We're gonna plug in here and check out the front. Hearing that fan kick on, there we go. And what are we gonna charge at? Going up and up and up. Wow, 1.05 kilowatts. So just a little bit over 1000 watts. Pretty awesome, and remember that's at 62%. It says it's gonna take 42 minutes to get to 100% with this amount of input. I have a little plug icon here that's plugged into the grid power, and our output is off, a little flashing fan. It's actually very quiet, so I'm really just barely hearing a fan. So it looks like this is gonna be a quiet device for charging, which is always nice. I won't really bother you too much. Anyway, guys, we're gonna let this thing charge up to 100% from 63. I'm gonna put a 47 minute timer on my watch and let's see how close to 100 it gets. Usually these things take a bit longer to top off, even though they say how much it's gonna take here. All right, guys, so just wanted to check in with you during charging and it looks like the estimation is a little off and the reason for that is that once it hits 80%, see we're at 85%, it starts to drop its wattage. You can see how it's at 850 right now. And so it's slowly gonna drop as it reaches 100%. So that's why that this timing over here is definitely gonna be inaccurate. And that's usually how it is with all of them. It would be great if somewhere in the software, if they could calibrate it at the beginning to know how long it's gonna charge because as you can see, it's adjusting as the wattage goes down to a longer time. Anyway, that's how it is. Still waiting on this charge. Um, I'll get back to you when it's 100% and we'll just see how long uh, we actually have on our time. Okay guys, well that's gonna do it on our timer. We're just getting to the end of that 47 minutes, I think it was. And as you can see, we still have 25 minutes to go 
on the power station because look how much it's dropped the wattage. So really, I think there's something to be said for them somehow having a calculation in the software to accommodate that drop in charge wattage as it gets higher. But we're at 92%. Still got 25 minutes it's saying, so I'm gonna start a stopwatch right now and just see after that 47 minutes how much longer it takes to get this to 100%. A few moments later. 35 minutes about later, so 47 minutes plus 35. So we're definitely getting over an hour to charge this thing to 100% when it's out of the box. And it was kind of interesting because it went to 98%, wattage dropped to zero, and then it just kind of jumped to 100%. So usually these things need a little bit of time to kind of calibrate them on the first charge. And then after that, using them and charging again, they're more accurate. So hopefully that's the case with this one. Anyway, we're at 100%. Let's go ahead and start hooking up some crazy devices to this thing, see how much it can handle. Okay guys, so finally the real test. Uh, we wanna see how it's gonna perform with some high output items as well as low items as well, kind of like a cell phone, a iPad, stuff that you would normally just be camping with. If it can handle this stuff, uh, I might bring out the crock pot and see if it can handle that as well. But let's just go ahead and get started with these. I've got a liter of water right here. I've got a dual bay toaster, a cell phone and an iPad. So let's start plugging in and see what this thing can handle. So of course we're gonna plug into the AC rail. These do not have a third grounding wire. So I'm just gonna plug these into the top. AC outlets on the toaster and that guy. And then the phone will plug in right here to the PD 3.0. Okay, and the iPad will plug in to the other PD 3.0. The other USBs are basically just gonna be a lower uh, voltage of the same thing. So before we plug everything in, let's go ahead and turn this thing on. Remember we charged it to 100%. So there is our readout. Oh, we're getting that little bit of a wacky uh, flash there just from the frequency on my camera. But regardless, I think you can see what's going on. So let's turn on the USB rail here. Just click and hold. And we can see that we have a few icons that came up here. And let's go ahead and turn on the AC rail down here. There we go. So little AC plug icon came up there. Toaster just clicked on. So those are working. Let's go ahead and plug in maybe the cell phone first. Let's see what kind of charge we can get out of it. There we go. It's informing me that I'm 39% and charging. And this is charging at 17 watts. A lot of phones now, they use their own proprietary kind of charging system. And this OnePlus phone uses an AC adapter that can charge up to like 80 watts. So we're not using that right now, but as you can see, it's just charging at 17 watts. From there, let's pop on the iPad. There we go, we got the charge notification and we're going up to about 29, 30 watts there. Let's start doing some of these high output items. So first thing I'm gonna do is this water kettle, electric water kettle, I'm gonna click it on here. Remember we have an output of only 27 watts and it's gonna last us, looks like 40 hours around there. So let's click on this bad boy. We're getting a blue light Hearing the fan come on on the unit a little bit louder, not too bad. Outputting at 1.10 kilowatt. So we're gonna just kind of leave that running and see if it boils while we use the toasters. Remember a two bay toaster, this is also gonna suck some wattage. But let's just see what happens if it trips or whatever happens when we try to run all these things at the same time. This is kind of the real test, the main test you wanna see what it can handle. So power on the toaster, push down for a medium toast. 1.99 kilowatts, woo! It's gonna last for one hour, which is reasonable. Two kilowatt hour device using two kilowatts is gonna last one hour, that's what that means. It's able to run both of these things. Wow, amazing. Let's just kind of see if it trips or something because this is basically maxing out at two kilowatts right now. And I'm just gonna kind of let it do its thing until the toaster finishes in a minute and a half. And I wanna see if that comes to a full boil and this whole thing doesn't trip. Phone is still charging. iPad does still have the charge icon here. So nothing has tripped so far. Looking good. Looking good. 
Okay guys, so the toaster just clicked off, finished its toast. Water is still boiling. We're at 94% uh, on our battery power here. So effectively, these are like, you know, 1000 watts each for these heating elements. And it uh, looks like it tells you how much you got left. So we got 1.7 hours left at this one kilowatt draw and we're 94% power. All right guys, reaching full boil, here we go. This sucker is at a rolling boil. So you can definitely boil a liter of water, no problem with this thing. There it goes, it just clicked off. And do two pieces of toast at the same time. So that tells you that it will run pretty much any small heating appliance, like a coffee maker, kettle, toaster, all the major things you're going to want to use in, uh, you know, when you're camping or in your RV trailer, you know, motorhome, whatever you have it. So this thing can perform. Very impressed. I'm going to go ahead and get that crock pot. Let's put it on and see if we can make this thing tap out. Here we go. We got the Ninja kind of air fryer crock pot baker little oven all in one. These things are really popular now. I use it a lot. And uh, these are something you might want to take with you on your outing or your adventure. So let's see if it works. We're going to plug into the middle plug. Still have everything plugged in. Got the toaster on top now. So let's see what it takes to make this thing trip or what it does. Some of them have an overdraw and hopefully the e-taker has something where it can kind of dumb down the wattage and still run items like others have because it doesn't have some of the smart features like others do with wireless charging or uh, wireless app control we'll go ahead and set this bad boy to just an air crisp looking at our wattage we're at 1.46 kilowatts so this thing takes almost 1500 watts 1400 ish to run so that sucker is air crisping now we're going to see if we can trip it by turning on the kettle again boom 2.5 kilowatts holy smokes man this thing oh and we just tripped it there we go so that did it 2.5 was too much for it and it looks like it just totally turned off the ac rail so it looks like you just have to turn the whole unit off and then turn it back on and hold in for your AC again. Okay guys, so we can see how we're tripping it. Let's start this up again. So 2.5 kilowatts, too much for it. It did start it up though. It flashed at like 2.6 kilowatts for a second just to start that oven up and then it dumbed down. So it looks like it's going to do that initial peak and be able to handle it, but not a cons constant uh, draw of 2.5. Let's see what it does with the toaster. So now we're up to 2.3. Are we gonna be able to do this? It's still going at 2.3 kilowatts. Let's just see. Whoop! Oh, that kind of scared me. <laughs> and that kind of scares me. So it couldn't do 2.3. So kind of anything over the two kilowatt range is gonna trip it if it's on for a while. It doesn't really have those heavy lifting modes where it dumbs down the maximum wattage just to run these type of dumb devices. And when I say dumb devices, what I mean is these are just heating elements. Of course, that has a computer on board, but it doesn't seem to care if the wattage goes lower or, or higher. Some of them, they'll have a, it's called a heavy lifting mode where you put that on and uh, say the maximum is a 2000 watt device you turn all these on it'll limit the output to 2000 watts and won't clip off so it'll take longer to cook them but at least they'll all run this doesn't seem to have that and i think that's gonna kind of wrap it up guys that's everything i really wanted to test uh, it looks like the ac tripping mechanism is working fine you just have to turn the unit off and back on and that's not malfunctioning at all it just has that uh, over two kilowatt limit anyway let's kind of do a little uh pro and cons here the absolute main thing i'm liking about the e-taker 2000 watt guys is build quality it's the construction is phenomenal the kind of tubular aluminum case is great it seems to be you know just going to be really durable really strong and all they're doing is they're just shoving the electronics right through it and then you just have plastic on both ends so i really like the build quality it looks like it's going to be very durable some of them have sides that are really flexy and look like they're going to crack. Performance wise, fine. It's going to run everything you need to up to just a little over 2000 watts before it clips. All these things are working. Uh, charges great with the solar panel back there. The e-taker solar panel works fine. So really like how it's super portable and light. Although remember we had the con on something that's like flexi solar panel and thin and light. 
it's going to get blown around in the wind a little bit more. So just keep in mind on that. You're going to have to tie that thing down if the wind picks up. As far as the power station goes, uh, no complaints except for, remember we had that kind of weird car charging thing where we put it in the car and it was reading zero watts, but it was still charging. Uh, that's one of the a little quirks, but then after a while it started working. So I'm not sure what, what's up with that. Doesn't seem like we can update the software on this because it's not a wireless interface at all. On a lot of them, you can hook up your cell phone and you can monitor it and update it with the cell phone. But this doesn't seem to have that. So that's definitely one negative there. And then it also doesn't have any wireless charging. A lot of them now have like a circle up here that you can put your phone on and you can charge it at like around 15 watts. This doesn't have any of that. It's just a power station that is fairly smart, does a good job at powering items, but doesn't have any of those little extra wireless features that a lot of them do now. One more little nitpick, and this is probably not gonna matter to a lot of people, but they don't give you a bag for all of your cables. They just give you a cardboard box that you're probably gonna to wanna to throw away. So for traveling purposes, this is a bag from a different brand I'm reviewing. E-Taker, if you're listening, uh, I already threw away the box and I have all these cables that are just hanging around. I really wish you would include a bag. So hopefully you're listening. You just give us a little zipper bag to hold all of our cables. So that's definitely another one of the three cons on this power station. Anyway, guys, I hope you really enjoyed that e-taker uh, test, that review. I think we really put this thing through its paces. We saw what it can and can't do. And if you wanted to pick one up, if you're interested in this, go ahead and check in down in the description down below. I usually have a coupon code where you can get this for uh, uh, save a little bit of money if you use my code. So make sure you check that stuff down below. Anyway, guys, one of the better, more durable units I've seen without all the bells and whistles. Hope you enjoyed that and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.